how the next question got here, which is a question about Martin Luther calling Jesus an adulterer. I got. I maybe we'll make this little conversation into a video as well because there's a lot. Man, oh man, is there a lot of stuff about Luther out there? And people say, how can you call yourself a Lutheran? How can you follow? In fact, I was having this conversation last night. Someone said, you call yourself a Lutheran? That's like following after a man. And I said, well, do you know how the name started? And they said, no. And I said, well, it was it was written down by the Pope. It was in the, in the first bull warning of Luther's excommunication, where it made Luther an outlaw, and it made everyone who followed Luther an outlaw. It banned Luther's books, and it called the people who read his books and believed what he said, it called them Lutherans. The, if, when the Lutherans were inventing names for themselves, they called themselves the evangelicals, the, the, the gospelers, the gospel clingers, <laughs> The ones who who stuck to the Lord's word, especially the promise of forgiveness of sins. But but here comes the insult. Ah, oh, you're Lutherans. You follow Luther. And uh, they said, well, if that's what you're going to call us, then we'll just take it. We'll we'll embrace it. They never liked it, but it was an insult that they said, if that's if what it means is to is to is to cling to the clarity of the forgiveness of sins, and to trust as our sole authority the Scriptures, then fine. We'll take it. So they they took the name Luther. It's not following a man for sure. I mean, Luther was a sinner of all people. He was a sinner. We don't consider him to be a saint, to be prayed to or venerated or anything else like this. The only helpfulness that that Luther brings to us is that he would point us to Christ and to the clarity of scriptures, and that's exactly that's exactly what he did. So the name Lutheran is shorthand for believer of the Bible. Now everyone claims to have the Bible, so you got to have all these distinctions about uh, about the infallibility of the scriptures and what does it teach about baptism and what does it teach about the gospel and the Lord's Supper and all this sort of stuff. So it just becomes a shorthand to kind of put all those things together. But then there's a lot of stuff that people say, well, if you could follow Luther, then you got to defend Luther for saying all this sort of stuff. And one of those things is, did Luther call Jesus an adulterer? And I want to talk about that, but we got to go to the break. So we're going to go to a quick break now, and we'll be back to take up this question. What was Luther talking about when he says this? Christ was an adulterer for the first time with the woman at the well. So there you go. We'll talk about that when you get back from the break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Cross Defense. Christ was an adulterer for the first time with the woman at the well. This is from Martin Luther's table talk recorded by, I can't remember, some guy. He again was an adulterer with Magdalene and still again with the adulterous woman in John 8, whom he, who he let off so easily. So the good Christ had to become an adulterer before he died. Now this is a really, so, so the accusation goes, that Luther taught that Jesus was somehow a a, a breaker of the Sixth Commandment, that he was an adulterer, that he committed adultery with someone. And this is, of course, blasphemy. I mean, this is Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was not a, a sinner. He was perfect in every way. He didn't break any of God's laws. In fact, the righteousness of Christ is that righteousness which is delivered to us in the doctrine of justification so that Jesus perfectly kept the Ten Commandments, and he gives that perfect keeping of the Ten Commandments to us. So that if Jesus was a lawbreaker, if he, had, if he could be guilty of breaking any of the commandments, then he could not be the Savior. I mean, it's so, that is so simple and, and so clear, but so the people say, well, what about what Luther says here? What does it mean? Well, first of all, we should not put our own sort of, I don't know, loose sexual immorality on Luther, because to be alone with a woman, especially in the ancient world, and even in Luther's time, was to open yourself up to the accusation of being unfaithful. But there's something even more than that. I mean, that's a a simple enough explanation, but there's something even more than that that's happening theologically. And I'd like to read you a couple of paragraphs, work through a couple of paragraphs with you from Luther's comments on Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Luther writes, Paul guarded his words carefully and spoke precisely. Here again, a distinction must be made. Paul's words clearly show this. For he does not say that Christ became a curse on his own account but that he became a curse for us. Thus, the whole emphasis is on the phrase, for us. For Christ is innocent, 
so far as his own person is concerned. Therefore, he should not have been hanged from the tree. But because, according to the law, every thief should have been hanged, therefore, according to the law of Moses, Christ himself should have been hanged, for he bore the person of a sinner and a thief, and not of one, but of all sinners and thieves. For we are sinners and thieves, and therefore we are worthy of death and eternal damnation. But Christ took all our sins upon himself, and for them he died on the cross. Therefore it was appropriate for him to become a thief, and as Isaiah says, Isaiah 53 verse 12, to be numbered among thieves. Do you see that Jesus didn't ever steal anything, but he was numbered among, he was called a thief. Why? Because he was carrying our sin. He was taking our guilt on himself, and he was suffering the consequence of our sin, of of, of our breaking of God's law, of our thievery and our greed. He He is the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, but on him is placed all of our sin and iniquity. Luther continues, And all the prophets saw this, that Christ was to become the greatest thief, murderer, adulterer, robber, desecrator, blasphemer, etc., that there has ever been anywhere in the world. But he is not acting in his own person now. Now he is not the Son of God born of a virgin, but he is a sinner who has and bears the sin of Paul the former blasphemer, persecutor, and assaulter, of Peter, who denied Christ, of David, who was an adulterer and a murderer, and who caused the Gentiles to blaspheme the name of the Lord. In short, he has and bears all the sins of all men and his body, not in the sense that he has committed them, but in the sense that he took these sins committed by us upon his own body in order to make satisfaction for them with his own blood. Do you see the difference? Luther's saying that Jesus, and this is just the the biblical doctrine, Luther's saying that that Jesus didn't commit these sins. he, He did not commit adultery. David committed adultery. He did, not com- he did not commit blasphemy. Paul committed blasphemy. He did not commit murder. Moses committed murder. But in order to be, but, but in order to, to save us and to save them, Jesus takes that sin and he now suffers the consequence for it. God's anger. What, he, what Jesus is suffering on the cross is God is not angry with Jesus because he didn't do anything wrong but he's taking all of the wrong that we have done and he's bearing that in our place. He's suffering that in our place. He's carrying that burden in our place. It's not like Jesus, like Luther saying that that Jesus was walking around committing sin with people. No, I mean, of course not. He was perfect in every way. And and Luther preaches this all the time. He says that you gotta be like, you have to be willfully ignorant of of Luther's teaching to think that he, he would think something like this. Uh, is, here, I'll, I'll, I just want to read a little bit more here. This, this is really good. The knowledge of this knowledge of Christ, that he is. Ex, that, oh, let me go back even further. Uh, thus, a, uh, thus, a magistrate regards someone as a criminal and punishes him if he catches him among thieves, even though the man never committed anything evil or worthy of death. Christ was not only found among sinners. But of his own free will, and by the will of the Father, he wanted to be an associate of sinners, having assumed the flesh and blood of those who were sinners and thieves, and who were immersed in all sorts of sin. Therefore, when the law found him among thieves, it it condemned and executed him as a thief. This knowledge of Christ, and most delightful comfort, that Christ became a curse for us to set us free from the curse of the law. Of this, the sophists deprive us when they segregate Christ from sins and sinners and set him forth to us only as an example to be imitated. 
In this way, they make Christ not only useless to us, but a judge and a tyrant who's angry because of our sin and who damns sinners. But just as Christ is wrapped up in our flesh and blood, so we must wrap him and know him to be wrapped up in our sin, our curse, our death, and everything evil. But this is a highly absurd and insulting thing to call the Son of God a sinner and a curse. If you want to deny, that's, this is the accusation against Luther, if you want to deny that he's a sinner and a curse, then deny also that he suffered, that he was crucified, that he died. For it is no less absurd to say, as our creed confesses and prays, that the Son of God was crucified and underwent torments of sin and death than it is to say that he's a sinner or a curse. But if it is not absurd to confess and believe that Christ was crucified among thieves, then it is not absurd to say as well that he was a curse and a sinner of sinners. Surely these words of Paul are not without purpose. Christ became a curse for us. And for our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Now this is a truly stunning text. Paul says, I'm going to go to it, 2 Corinthians 5. I've been reading 2 Corinthians all morning this morning. What an absolutely stunning book this is. And right in the middle of it, we get to this, this, this fantastically beautiful theological part. Paul says, let me start back in verse 18, verse, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. All of this, 17, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that Jesus is perfect in every way and never commit. He, he, according to the law, he was absolutely righteous. He never broke any of the commandments. He did everything that the commandments required of him. So that Jesus and Jesus alone amongst everyone who's ever lived, Jesus alone is perfect. And yet God made him to be sin so that he takes all of your sin, all of your guilt, all of your shame, all of your breaking of the law, all of your covetousness and and lying and lust and adultery and anger and murder and rebellion and blasphemy and, and despising of God's word and idolatry and all, he takes all of it. Every bit of your sin, and he puts it onto Christ. So much so that Christ is made sin. That's what St. Paul says, that he is made sin. And all of the wrath of God that you deserve and that I deserve, all of the anger of God, all of the holy justice of God, all of it falls on Jesus. And then his perfection and his righteousness, and his keeping of the law, his perfect purity in every way, that is given to you. This is what the old theologians called the great exchange, that Jesus takes your sin, your death, your deserved wrath of God, and you get his righteousness and his perfection and his peace and his life and his joy and his comfort, all of it. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the right, and listen to this, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. (laughs) The righteousness that the gospel delivers to us is not the righteousness of Adam and Eve before the fall. It's the righteousness of God. It's the perfection of Christ. And this is the gospel. 
And this, this is what Luther was preaching page after page after page. If Jesus was not the holy and innocent Lamb of God who committed sins in his person, if, 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 if Luther would have, would have taught that, then Jesus could have been the Savior. This is a purpose, purposeful misunderstanding of Luther, and, and purposeful for two reasons. One, because you just want to dismiss the guy out of hand. But two, because in a demonic way, you want to dismiss the, the, the glorious comfort that it gives. That for King David, the murderer and the adulterer, Jesus was punished as a murderer and adulterer. For St. Paul, the blasphemer and persecutor, Jesus was punished as a blasphemer and persecutor. And for you too, I mean for every, for every sin that bounces around in your conscience, for every, for every, for, for everybody, every bit of guilt that troubles you, keeps you up at night, for all of it, Jesus suffered. And he, and he did so willingly because he wanted to give you his righteousness and his peace. So Jesus became your sin too, to redeem you, to rescue you from the wrath of God, to, to bring you from the kingdom of darkness to his eternal light, to forgive you all your sins. God be praised. God be praised for the clarity of that great exchange, that everything dark, of mine belongs to Jesus, and everything good of his, dear saints, that belongs to you. God be praised.